Hey, what's going on? I'm Eric Spensley, and today we've got more of your Instagram questions to answer on Spensley Design Co. All right, so the first question for part two of the Q&A series is from Pablo Estrada. He wants to know, oh, come on. I knew this was gonna come up. Do you have any injury due to carpentry? Which basically, did I hurt myself? <sighs> yes. So, <laughs> most of you probably haven't seen this and it's a pretty terrible video. I think it's my second video I ever did. I was building a TV stand and I was using a dowling jig, which basically has a drill bit with a collar on it and it stops on the collar so it doesn't go all the way through a piece of wood. Well, when I used it, I guess I didn't have the collar locked down all the way. So I drilled through the wood, everything worked great, and it went through the wood and into my fingers. Make sure that the collar on the drill bit is actually tightened down and you don't have your finger below where the drill bit would be, just in case it slips through, goes into your finger, and you have to go to the emergency room. Just saying. So I'll show a close up, and this is not like something super graphic. It's peeled now, it's totally fine. So I'll show you my finger, and that is gonna be permanent. And so if you look in all of my videos now, I have a really weird looking finger and it's never gonna come back to normal. Now I can use it just fine and everything feels right. It just looks kind of weird. So yes, I have hurt myself. Let's see, next question comes from St. Azkaban. Good prison. What's the best material to use for router templates? So I would actually change this question slightly. I would say what material works best for me because everyone kind of does it differently. Actually, most people use MDF. So I use MDF, which is medium density fiberboard. The reason I use that is because it's really easy to fine tune. So if you have some small bumps on it, you can just blast it down with a little bit of sanding and it's way faster than something like plywood. However, if you're somebody that does something like those weird charcuterie boards, with those like weird handles and stuff, and you crank out like a thousand of those, I would pay someone to make a template for you that's like made out of acrylic or something like that, that's not gonna take as many bumps and bruises if it's something that you're gonna use like all the time. But I don't do anything like that, so I just use MDF because it's really cheap. Next question, from Dry Bosom, weird name, uh, what's the next big tool that you plan to buy? Fantastic question. I've actually been searching for a planer. I have one of those like Amazon things that like, checks like every was it, like every hour or something for like a price. And I really want to pick up the DeWalt 735 planer. So I think I'm going to get one of those pretty soon. Um, I really just want to get a good deal on it. And I know that's one of those tools that like a, a lot of people really want it. So once I upgrade from that in the future, when I have a shop that has a better power and I can get like a 15, 20 inch planer, I'll be able to sell that for a decent amount of money. So that's what I'm going to try to get next. The next question comes from Freddie Mercury. Oh, I know that guy. Uh, which one would you choose? A bandsaw or a combination of a planer and joiner? That's a fantastic question. I would love to have all three of them. However, it's, you know, size limitations in this garage and power limitations, it's not gonna happen. I would actually say for me, a joiner and planer I would want before a bandsaw. The reason I say that is because right now I have to buy all pre-surfaced lumber, which to give you an idea of what I pay, um, if I were gonna buy a walnut, it's like 12 to $13 per board foot for pre-surfaced lumber. Whereas if I could buy it rough sawn, um, in my area it'd be, I think $4 a board foot. So you're talking like three times the price for me to get pre-milled lumber. And that adds up really, really fast. I know that I could, you know, make up the cost difference very quickly. Plus, if you've ever bought pre-milled lumber, you know that it's still not flat. Let's move on to the next question. All right, so the next question is from, hey, it's from Trip Southern. He's one of my Patreon supporters, a uh, great guy, and he's helping me get closer to quitting my full-time job and doing, you know, woodworking and all this content for more of a living. 
So if you want to join him in supporting me and get stuff like sweatshirts, t-shirts, and gift cards to my online store every single month, check out that Patreon link down in the description below. So he wants to know, what is my least used tool? That is an awesome question. So this kind of gets back to what I was talking about in part one, where I said only buy the tools that you need for that specific project. I fell victim to the, oh, I'm starting woodworking, I gotta buy this, I gotta buy this, I gotta buy this, I have to buy everything that I see. And I bought some stupid stuff. I mean, not stupid, but I don't use them. So the first thing was miter saw. Ended up giving that to a friend. Other than that, I would say probably a nail gun. Now I bought like a cordless battery nail gun that works with my drill platform. I think it was like $120 and I, I don't think I've even used a full box of brad nails on it. Like that thing was the biggest waste of money ever for me because I just thought like, oh, I see everybody has, you know, air compressors and nail guns. Like, oh, I should probably have one too. Like, no, I don't need it. So don't buy tools that you don't need for that specific project and you won't run into headaches like me. All right, so the next question is from Ann. Ann Frickens. Drew a cat. And they wanna know what table saw setup do you use and would you recommend it? Oh my gosh, no. I have the rigid R4513. I had to write the model number down because I never remember those things. It is a terrible saw. And I guess, let me back up for a second. It is one of the worst saws. Um, it's by far the worst saw that I've ever used. However, that's kind of unfair to say because I've only ever used a five horsepower power manic and a three horsepower saw stop, both of which are professional cabinet saws. This specific saw is not meant to build fine furniture. And I remember like reading that when I bought it and I was like, ah, oh, whatever, these are just like, you know, people that are just high and mighty about having the best tools in the world telling me this won't work for furniture. No, like it really won't. The first thing is that whenever you set this to any sort of alignment or anything, it finds its way to get out of alignment. And I've even gone so far as to like use Loctite on all the screws and everything, but it doesn't matter. It still won't stay square. Even if you just adjust the fence and then take the fence off, put it back on, it's not square anymore. So it, it's a nightmare. Don't buy the saw. So the reason that I have this one is because it was the very first saw that I bought when I just kind of wanted to see like, do I enjoy woodworking and everything? And I haven't bought another one now because I want to wait until I'm out of the shop and have like full power requirements to get a nice cabinet saw. So I don't wanna basically spend, you know, a thousand dollars on a saw now and then have it not be the saw that I really want and then kind of like lose some money. So I'm gonna try to stick it out until I can buy a more expensive saw. So next question. This is from Bliss Custom Woodworking. I still think you should do a SketchUp video. And I, you know, he messaged me about this and I told him that I, I think there's so many SketchUp videos out there that I don't know necessarily if anybody would benefit from me doing one. So if you want me to do a SketchUp video, you need to leave a comment down below and tell me why you want me to do a SketchUp video. Cause I'm happy to do one, but I feel like I'm gonna put a lot of work into it and like nobody's ever gonna watch it. So if you want one, comment down. The next question is from, oh. The next question is again from Dry Bosom. What's one thing you wish you had known when getting started? Basically, how long do things take? Oh my yeah. I didn't realize that it, like filming everything was gonna take so long. So to give you an idea, if I think I can physically finish a project with no interruptions, just blast into a project in, let's say one whole day, I'm going to assume just to build and film, we're not talking like edit, make plans or anything. I'm gonna assume it's gonna take me at least four to five days to make that project. So yeah, it slows me down like crazy to film all this stuff. And then when you throw in having to edit all the video, make plans, all the back end stuff that you guys never see, it takes a really, really long time to get these projects out. And like for one whole year, Miranda and I did one project every single week and it was terrible. It was so, so hard to get all that stuff out that like I truthfully wasn't really enjoying any of the stuff that I was building. I just wanted to get like a nice solid base of content, which I think you guys can kind of tell that my projects have become 
different now. I still like to do some small projects here and there, just kind of like break the monotony, because sometimes when I build a really big project, I'm like so over it and I just want like a quick win, like, oh, I'm gonna, you know, do something small. Yeah, I mean, the thing I didn't know the most was just how much time was gonna go into all of this. So the next question is from Freddie. How did you keep yourself motivated at the beginning? Basically coming up with new ideas for like clients or for me. I guess the, the first place I kind of start with is like I have like a problem solving mentality. If I see a piece of furniture or something at home, I kind of look at it and like, I just wish it had this. Usually it's a specific feature and so I'll kind of write that kind of stuff down and oh, I wish I had a piece of furniture that had a slide out tray or something like that. And I kind of have a list of like all these different like requirements or design ideas. And I always try to like build them into a new project. The other thing is I'm still, I, I consider myself a beginner with woodworking. So like I'll find techniques and tricks and stuff that people use. And I'll try to design a project around me using a technique. So like I wanted to try template routing, for example. So naturally, I designed projects that would allow myself to make a template and then route the template. The other thing with clients is I always ask clients to send me kind of like inspiration ideas. A lot of people will send me, hey, here's this thing from Etsy, make it. And I won't do that. I'm happy to make my own rendition of something from Etsy. You know, maybe, oh, design idea. Like for example, the Tim table here. This is the table that I designed for someone. However, this is what he had originally sent me. So you can see the same ideas there, which like that flip top charging table. However, like it's a completely different design. So the next question is from EMF Yurniture. How was your experience starting out acquiring tools and getting clients? I kind of talked about it briefly, but the way I acquired tools when I very, very, very first started is I borrowed them from a friend. I borrowed a miter saw, which I know talk a lot of crap about miter saws, but that was the first tool that I borrowed. And I knocked out a couple projects with that. And then I also borrowed a couple tools from my parents. So I had very minimal money invested at the beginning on tools until I absolutely knew that I needed something. So the very first thing that I bought was like a starter kit of different like Ryobi tools. I think it's those tools back there with like the drill and circular saw and everything. So I bought that in like a Black Friday pack that was pretty cheap. And then ever since then, I've only bought tools when I need it for a project. Now, as far as acquiring clients go, it very first started out with me making stuff for like friends and family and I'd pretty much give it to them. Then I kind of graduated to building stuff at cost for people. So let's be real for a second. If you are somebody who wants to make five, $10,000 coffee tables, dining tables, whatever, and you have no portfolio, no one's going to buy from you. No one is going to put down, you know, what they could buy a car for, for a piece of furniture from somebody that they've never seen any of their work. So that's always one of my first suggestions to people when they first start out is to price their stuff fairly competitively just to get themselves out there. And you don't have to do that for a long period of time. And I know some people would actually argue against what I'm telling you, but it worked for me. And the very last question of our first Q&A series is from Taylor, oh, Taylor's, a, Taylor's a draft 24 seven. Sorry to hear that. Advice for beginning woodworkers and what would you do differently if you could go back? I think the first thing that I would do differently is not try to jump on all these trends. I thought, hey, if I do like a live edge epoxy table or something like that, that's going to be the thing that makes my channel go huge and I'll be so popular. And it's, <laughs> it's funny to look back on that now because that's actually one of my worst performing videos. I thought that was just going to be an absolute bomb. I was going to have, you know, thousands of subscribers just from that video alone and I didn't. Really my best suggestion is to stop trying to be other people and just be you. I know that's one of those like really common things that everybody says, but it's true. It's so much harder to like try to put up a persona and do what you think people might like as opposed to just doing what you like and 
seeing if people like that. You'll find an audience. People will like you if you show your personality. But if you're just trying to be this like blanket person that likes everything, uh, no one's really going to connect with that. And I think the same thing goes for woodworking. And I'm, I'm not trying to blast anybody who does any of these specific things, but I think if you're one of those people who like only makes fad products or projects, you're just gonna get lost in the weeds and like you're never really gonna pop because you know, you're, you're making the exact same thing that everybody else is. But yeah, in general, I would just say, be yourself. I mean, it's gonna take you time to kind of like learn what you like, who you are, but allow yourself to make those mistakes and grow from it. So thank you guys so much for submitting all these questions and I hope this was helpful. I hope this video is a good way for you to get to know me a little bit better because I know that I don't do a very good job of talking to the camera. So that is one of my New Year's resolutions, is to talk to the camera more often, to kind of give my personality to you so you can connect with me a little bit more. But in the meantime, I wanna thank you so much for stopping by and checking us out. And remember to check out all of my other projects if you're interested, and I'll see you on the next one.